For 30 years, FBI agent Stephen Draper had been investigating the disappearances of children under the ages of 15 across the U.S. What he uncovered is almost unbelievable. He himself said he wouldn't have believed it either had he not been the one investigating. He stated in interviews he never gave his opinion one way or another to his superiors on what he uncovered for fear of the backlash he'd receive. He'd only ask questions and record what the victim's families told him, then introduce it as part of the investigation. He said what he discovered has truly terrified him over the years, and now routinely does something every single night before he goes to bed without fail. This is his story as it was told to and recorded by a close friend in 2015. I joined the FBI in 1982, then was quickly assigned to head up a special task force that investigated the disappearances of children under the age of 15. This task force wasn't investigating just random disappearances of children. They had to be unusual or unique disappearances and meet certain criteria for my team or me to get involved. For example, the child had to have disappeared from their house at night with no sign of forced entry or visible evidence as to what happened. Disappeared without a trace, so to speak. Hence the reason this special task force was created. Now we'd always start out focusing on the parents, family members, or close friends, as they're the most likely suspects in cases like these, which more times than not turned out to be true. It wasn't until 1985 we ran into the first cryptic case we eventually dubbed every seven years. I don't care if you don't believe what I'm about to tell you. I have my own opinion and I still struggle with it to this day. I will tell you this though, there's no way on God's green earth these people all across the U.S. could be in on the same exact lie. None of them ever knew or met each other, and this was long before the internet was a thing. I still vividly remember the first every seven years case. We learned a lot from this case, being it was the first time we'd heard it, so we didn't have any ideas or opinions formed yet. We got a call about some parents in a New York City apartment, waking up Saturday morning to discover their six-year-old daughter had mysteriously vanished sometime during the night, after they put her to bed. Sometimes, when we'd meet parents, it was hard to judge whether or not their distraught was real or fake. When my team and I met these parents, it was obvious right off the bat that they were sincere in their distraught. Sometimes you can just tell it's real and they're innocent, especially if you're a parent also. This was certainly the case with this family. I think my team and I, in our minds, quickly eliminated them as suspects which is not a good thing to do when you're investigating, but we're also human. We sat down with the parents in their living room and proceeded to ask them the standard questions we ask everyone at first. When was the last time you saw your child? Were there any noises? Anyone else over at the apartment last night, etc. It wasn't until the mother mentioned something that stopped us dead in our tracks. I'll never forget what she said. She said, a week ago, her daughter had been extremely scared to go to bed, saying someone was whispering to her from underneath her bed. The mother said this happened every night as a daughter would sometimes scream for help at night. And of course, they'd come running, ask her what happened, then check under her bed. And nothing was there. They played it off as her just having nightmares. I then happened to ask the mother when this started exactly, and she told me the date, which happened to be exactly seven days before. At the time, we didn't think anything of it, that is, until we started to see a disturbing pattern. The following day, we got another call from another family in New York City that sounded very similar to the case we were now investigating. The only difference was the child who vanished was eight years old. During the interview, the parents mentioned the same creepy detail about the child being scared. 
saying someone was whispering to them under their bed. I again asked them when exactly it started, and they gave me the precise date, which was exactly seven days before. It wasn't until the third child the following day, which just so happened to be the third day since we'd arrived in New York City, that we noticed we obviously had a disturbing pattern. All the children told their parents of whispering under their beds, and it had started for all of them exactly seven days before the child disappeared. We started to think we had a serial kidnapper on our hands. This went on and happened for seven days to a total of seven children while we were in New York City. After the seventh day, it suddenly stopped. For several years after that, we devoted all of our energy, time, and thousands of man hours into these seven disappearances. We came up empty handed, not a single piece of solid evidence. It was like the children had literally vanished into thin air. Our superiors finally pulled us off of the cases and shelved them. In 1992, exactly seven years later to the day, I remember I was sitting at my desk drinking my first cup of coffee of the morning when my phone suddenly rang. Somehow I knew before I picked it up what the call was about. It was a sheriff from Seattle, Washington, who had been referred to me by a colleague. The first sentence out of his mouth was about three children mysteriously vanishing from their beds during the night in Seattle over the last three days. I immediately responded saying there's going to be a fourth child tonight and I'll be on the first plane there. My team and I caught the red eye to Seattle that very night. The sheriff greeted us at the airport early the following morning. The first thing I asked was if he'd gotten the fourth call yet, and he said he had not. I said you will soon. Two hours later, the call came. We all scrambled over to the missing child's home. This time, I didn't start off with the usual questions. The first thing I asked was if their child had mentioned whispering coming from under her bed over the last week. They were shocked and dumbfounded. They finally replied, saying their nine-year-old daughter did indeed mention it. That opened a can of worms I wished I hadn't. But there wasn't any time for bullshit at this point. I knew there were going to be three more disappearances, and there was almost nothing I could do about it. But we had to try. All we could do was ask questions and record the conversation. However, this time was slightly different than the others. They did mention hearing some loud muffling noises coming from their daughter's room, so they immediately ran into her room, but she was gone. The windows were closed and locked, so whoever or whatever took her didn't go through the window, and it was impossible they'd come out of the room without being seen as the parents ran quickly from their room to hers, which was less than four seconds, because we timed it. We knew there was going to be another disappearance, and we debated broadcasting it on the news so parents could be prepared, but the powers that be wouldn't let us, fearing it would cause unnecessary panic. They said it was pure speculation. The following morning, the call we all dreaded came. This one was different from all the rest. The mother happened to walk into the child's room and witness something truly terrifying. She stated she'd forgotten to wash her child's clothes she really wanted to wear the following day, so she went into her room to get them. She stated as she walked in, she witnessed her seven-year-old daughter being pulled under the bed by a rather large, gray wrinkled hand that had very long, dark yellowish nails from what she could see, given the only light she had was from the hallway. She ran as fast as she could to the bed to try and grab her, but wasn't fast enough. She screamed for her husband, who came running as fast as he could. They, of course, frantically searched under the bed and her entire room, but could find no trace of her anywhere. Within a few minutes, they called the authorities, who came 15 minutes later after her mother had witnessed their daughter being pulled under the bed. Over the next two days, two more kids disappeared. Then it again abruptly stopped. The parents of the last two children didn't witness or hear anything. 
They did say their child mentioned the whispering from under the bed. Before we left Seattle, my team and I, which consisted of Tom Strickland, Kate Lay, and Bill Perry, sat down at dinner and talked about what we'd all been avoiding for so long. But after hearing what the fifth child's parents said, we could no longer deny it. We all agreed this was something more than a mere serial kidnapper or a deranged person, which led to us talking about otherworldly things, not of this world, or things which humans had not yet discovered. We didn't solve anything or come to a solid agreement during our talk at that dinner. We disagreed on a lot of things, but we could all agree that something was happening that no human being could explain. Even talking about it now is still hard for me, because I'm a facts and evidence guy. I'm not superstitious, and I don't even believe in God or the devil. Like before, we investigated these seven cases in Seattle for several years, and like the first seven cases back in 1985, we came up empty-handed yet again. We were at a loss, and it was hard for any of us involved in the case to openly speak about what the parents had told us. Years went by until November 15, 1997. I was sitting at my desk eating a ham sandwich from the local deli when an old man with a cane, who appeared to be around 70 to 80 years old, walked slowly into my office and asked for me by name. He sat down and proceeded to tell me a story I shall never forget. He said when he was 10 years old, six other children around his same age started mysteriously vanishing in his city, one every day for six days. On the seventh night, he was almost victim number seven, but just happened to jump off his bed in time before the large gray hand could grab him. Ever since that night, he said he's devoted his life to trying to stop what's been happening. He said every seven years, seven children get taken from their beds and are never heard from again. He said it only happens in big cities. I then asked him what he thinks happens to the children. He said he's not exactly sure, but he did say, based on his research, the same seven days, seven children disappearing has been happening across the globe and based on his findings from old books and newspapers this has been going on for centuries he said some folklore say it's some kind of demon that gets to feed on seven children every seven years other folklore say it's a witch some say it's the devil himself taking them to hell whatever it is they all agree on one thing though It's always seven years and always seven children, and the children are never heard from again. We talked for a while, and I of course asked him many questions, including the whispering from under the bed. He said, in his case, he never heard the whispering. When he got up to leave, he turned back to me and said, it can't be stopped. Don't waste your life away like I did. He then walked out of my office and I never heard from or saw him again. Hell, I didn't even ask him his name. So every night, I check under my bed, and will, till the day I die. For more scary horror stories, please subscribe.